today we are joined by uh, a few uh, delegates. Uh, there's one more thing that I need to highlight before I introduce them. Uh, one of the most important things that we're engaging with today is the topic. Um, so it is a very charged topic. And so I would encourage us to engage the topic from a position of love and grace. I know we may disagree with what may be shared or we may be in agreement and are passionate about it. But my encouragement to us is that as we engage this topic, that we do so charitably and that we reflect who Christ is. So uh, Dr. Edwards uh, hails from New York City by way of Washington, D.C. Uh, he's a learner. He's waving. So that's Dr. Edwards. He's a learner and a teacher, a husband and a father a pastor and a servant. His uh, Bachelor of Science degree is from Cornell, where he studied chemical engineering. His MDiv is from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and both his MA and PhD are in Biblical Studies from the Catholic University of America. He has been in urban ministry for 30 years, having started churches in Brooklyn and Washington, D.C., and recently served a congregation in Minneapolis. After being an adjunct seminary instructor for several years, he is now a full-time associate professor of New Testament at North Park Theological Seminary. Dr. Edwards is the author of the 2017 One Peter Commentary in the Story of God series, the 2019 monograph, What is the Bible and How Do We Understand It?, and the recently published 2020 monograph, Might from the Margins, The Gospel's Power to Turn the tables on injustice. Dr. Edwards, it is a privilege to have you in on the panel. It's a privilege to know you and uh, welcome to today's session. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Thank you. Moving on to the, our next panelist, uh, uh, Reverend Venon Light. Uh, Reverend Light uh, is a, served as a pastor and earned his MTH at the University of Fort Hare. Uh, he served as the principal of the Bible Institute in, East, in the Eastern Cape for many years. After retiring, retiring from BIEC, pardon me, he joined SATS as a lecturer and supervisor. He excels as an MTH thesis supervisor where his diligent commitment to good scholarship and his pastoral concern for each student combined to produce one successful candidate after another. Reverend Light is married to Heather and they have three adult children. Reverend Light is the author of Transforming the Church in Africa, a new contextually relevant discipleship model published in 2012. Morning, Reverend Light. It is good to have you on the panel. Thank you. Fantastic. We're going to move on to our next uh, panelist, introducing Reverend Stephen Murray. Uh, Reverend Stephen Murray is married to Robin, and they have two children, Genevieve and Christian. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Wazulu Natal, where he earned a BA in English and Classics. Uh, the Bible Institute, where he earned a BTH, and George Whitfield College, where he earned a BTH honors. Uh, before planting Hope City, Stephen served in various ministry capacities at churches in both Durban and Cape Town. He has a deep love and passion for Cape Town City, where he lives and serves God. For his many sins, uh, we will forgive him. He's a long-suffering uh, Arsenal football club uh, supporter. Uh, there is a place for you on uh, the red bus, uh, that is Liverpool bus, so you are welcome. And he used to call himself a surfer, but he's not sure if he can fit into his wetsuit anymore. Stephen, it is a joy to have you on the uh, panel. Good, good morning. Thanks, man. It's great to be here. Fantastic. And we're going to move on to our next panelist, uh, Pastor One Mokate. Uh, he is the lead pastor of Rooted Fellowship in Pretoria, South Africa. He's also the network director for X29 Southern Africa. He is married to Confidence and they have two daughters on it. Wonderful to have you on the panel, brother. It's good to be here, mate. Thanks. And uh, yeah, looking forward to today. Brilliant. Last but not least at all, uh, Pastor Jerome Gay joining us all the way from North Carolina. He is a founding and teaching pastor of Vision Church. He's married to Crystal Gay and they have two lovely children, Jamari and Christina Gay and Jerome Jordan Gay, sorry, Jamari Christi Christina Gay and Jerome Jordan Gay III, my apologies. Uh, pastor Jerome is a visionary leader 
of Vision Church, and he serves as a dynamic teacher and servant to the city of uh, Raleigh. Sorry, my apologies, I lost that one. Uh, Raleigh, <laughs> North Carolina. He loves sports, reading, and art. Pastor Gay, wonderful to have you on uh, the panel, and it is a joy uh, to get to know you. Uh, thanks for having me. Fantastic. Uh, friends, colleagues, uh, without much further ado, we're going to launch straight into today's topic. We are looking at critical race theory and the church in Southern Africa. So the first question is as follows. What is critical race theory and why has it garnered so much interest in ecclesial circles across the world lately? So anyone, please feel free to, uh, to help us understand what this theory is all about. Okay, I'll direct this one to Stephen Murray, if you don't mind. Over to you, Stephen. Uh, in, in some ways, I think if we could answer this question uh, nice and succinctly, then we could just end the seminar right now and everyone can go home and, and be happy. Um, I, I think this is one of the challenges, actually. Um, and depending on where you locate yourself, whether you're in the academy or you're a pastor or you're just a regular church member, you get very different answers to this question. Um, or even just a, 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 someone who follows the news. Uh, I mean, it's been in, in, in U.S. politics even just uh, discussed completely separate from, from church ministry. Um, my, my general understanding um, is, is that critical theories, and, and I, I think you'll, you'll talk about that more in, uh, down the line, but, but, but critical theories, and, and this, this pertains particularly to race, are analytical tools that are being used to try and understand particularly structural and systemic realities that exist between different groups, um, groups, generally socially constructed groups um, that exist out there and, and, and trying to explain why those groups relate to each other the way they do relate to each other and, and how where that relation has created oppressive environments that can be changed and, and something better can be produced out of that. Uh, that's a that for me is a very broad based umbrella description that I think then can cover a lot of different things because I think the one thing you'll find as soon as you dive into this field is that the minute you say, well, this is what critical theory is, someone with some expertise somewhere else is going to come along and tell you, well, no, that's not really what it is. Um, and, and it gets really, really complicated from that point in, I think. Fantastic. Uh, very succinct and to uh, the point. Uh, I'm going to ask Jer uh, Pastor Jerome Gay to uh, just open this up for us a bit more. And if you wouldn't mind giving us a bit of context, if you may, uh, if you'd like to do so. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, just, just to add to that, it essentially uh, divides humanity into those with privilege and power and those without it and um you know once once you do that then it it essentially creates an us against them kind of dynamic to where if you have the privilege and power then uh not in all but it can broad stroke people and essentially you're automatically an oppressor and so as a result of that then you uh, you must be opposed because there's an assumption that you are using that privilege and that power to oppress the poor or to oppress those without it. And then uh, I know we'll get into CRT or critical, uh, you know, critical race theory more. But if if uh, typically the way that plays out here in North America, um, if you're you're white, um, you are a part of a group of people who have systemically uh, oppressed people of color, um, which is historically factual. But now when you bring that into the, the, the modern day, then there can there can be there can be wrongly placed or mischaracterization of your character and who you are simply because you're white. Um, so essentially, you know, it, it puts people on the defensive. Um, it uh, for for from a Christian perspective, it can deny the Imago Dei in terms of the image of God um, because it asserts that you are an oppressor. And then it breaks the the oppressed um, as the victim. Uh, lastly, I would say, uh, based on James three one, uh, it shows favoritism. Um, when James talks in, in the book of James, and he says no no favoritism, um, you know there can be favoritism to the poor. You know e even if you are actually are an oppressed people, 
uh, that is not what makes you right with God. And so essentially, once you add that that racial component, there becomes a racial divide that there becomes mischaracterization and then which leads to misunderstanding. So if you embrace this view, uh, it's pretty it's practically impossible to actually reach a place of unity. Fantastic. Thank you so much for those definitions. I would open up for one more if there's any one from our panel would like to add a few thoughts to this before we move on to the next question. Uh, over to you, Dr. Dre. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm going to jump in. I'm, I'm the other North American here, but I'm uh, I'm uh, at a little bit different place than Pastor Gay in that while that I don't think the recognition of systemic uh, injustices that do look at society in terms of power dynamics automatically um, creates the divide. Uh, but I do think that critical race theory is one of those uh, uh, tools in the toolkit to help to describe how societies get um, uh, uh, hierarchical. So I, I don't think it automatically makes one the oppressor and the other oppressed. I do think, however, it does show that people can tap into uh, systems and structures and actually even become victims to the power of those structures and oftentimes don't realize it. So uh, I do see it as a, a as a potentially helpful lens for us to discuss uh, the way power operates. Fantastic. So uh, this is a definition that has been given uh, regarding critical race theory. And we have a few more questions to come uh, in line with what has been uh, laid on the table. So hopefully our audience have uh, located what where critical race theory is from a definition perspective and will continue to open up the layers of the onion uh, with the questions that follow. Over to the next question. What is the difference between critical theory and critical race theory? Uh, we often hear these terms being used in similar vogue, yet there are differences between them. So I'd like to know what the differences are. So if I may uh, ask uh, uh, Reverend Venom Light, uh, if you may, or if you'd like to engage this topic uh, for us, or open up this uh, question for us. Yes, uh, there is obviously overlap, but I think critical theory is, is the, the theory in its broadest dimensions, and it is not focusing particularly on analyzing power, let's say, in um, in the identity um, arena. In other words, it's not necessarily only um, investigating how power can operate, let's say, on racial lines, um, say, between whites and, and, and blacks. Um, and uh, so the critical race theory focusing particularly on 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 race the lens that it um, uses is is one to look at race and see how um, power operates between different race groups the, the dominant how the dominant group operates its position and um, so there certainly is uh, overlap we could say that critical race theory is almost like a daughter, if you like, of critical theory. It's homing in on one particular area where there are uh, power differences between two groups. Fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, that explanation. Uh, does anyone else want to add a few thoughts regarding the difference between the two or how the two are related? Bonnie, over to you. Yeah, so so to not repeat um, what's what's been said, but maybe just to highlight is is again, you know, critical theory is a uh, kind of a, a social um, theory or theorizing of wanting to understand society, um, getting to kind of its its core of how it works, and then with the desire to change it. Uh, critical race theory then looks at it from a, a race. Um, or racial perspective. And so even though uh, race in of itself, we talk about skin color as a social construct, um, it's, it, it seeks to understand it um, and get to the core of it to untangle the power and privilege dynamics that exist because it wants to change society from, from a, a racial perspective. Um, so, so that's, if you, if when looking at those two, that's kind of one of the simplest ways I try to explain it um, um, to others. 
is uh, is the one is is the theory. Um, the other one is kind of going into the specifics um, of of that particular society. Thanks so much for that. Um, I would like to hone in on the word critical because uh, often we hear the word critical and um, different things are conjured up in our minds. Uh, so some people approach the word critical from a negative stance. Other people approach the word critical uh, neutrally. And yet others uh, see it as meaning something else. Uh, can we trace the term critical uh, historically? Um, uh, if I trace it historically, we can go back to Immanuel Kant. Uh, and other places. Uh, and how has this term uh, been used in critical theory? Can we think of it as a positive or can we think of it as a negative? How is a term functioning within its use in critical theory and in critical race theory? Um, anyone? Maybe if I may direct this one to Dr. Dre. Um, I was going to jump in because in my in our world of biblical studies, we've borrowed a lot of English I mean, we've gotten a lot of English translations from German. So so that's one of the things that's happening with this term uh, critical or criticism. We use it for historical criticism, rhetorical criticism, textual criticism, all those. Uh, I tend to say to my students, think of it as a, as analysis. I think um, because we have a different connotation at times to criticism, we see it as merely pointing out negative things rather than an analysis. Um, but I think maybe something got lost in the translation. But uh, so I think the word is really more of an analytical. Uh, I think that's a fair uh, uh, perception. Yeah. Fantastic. We have covered two questions and we have a lot more ground to uh, go. Uh, in a few moments, we'll be opening up the chat box to the audience to pose their questions in line with the segment. So we have about three segments to cover. And this is the first one. So moving on to the quest third question now, uh, which is what are the pitfalls and advantages of treating critical race theory, intersectionality and social justice as a monolith? Why are these concepts often clustered together? So we have a few questions uh, there. Uh, intersectionality uh, being the concept that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 regarding the injustice that was faced uh, that black people, African American women rather, are faced in the workplace and how that affected them specifically as a people group. Um, social justice can be defined from a biblical standpoint or can be defined otherwise. So often we hear critical race theory, uh, intersectionality, social justice, social justice warriors, cultural Marxism, all these terms being clustered together. What are the pitfalls of doing this? And what are the advantages of doing so? I see Pastor Jerome Gays uh, is nodding, so I'll ask him to uh, open this up for us if you do not mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would, I, I'll zoom in on the pitfalls. The, the pitfalls are if you speak about justice and you point out some of the, the, the racial disparities, particularly here in America, as it, may, as it relates to policing, uh, job opportunities, um, those things, and you are immediately um, wrongly mischaracterized. And so the label of cultural Marxist is used very loosely. And this is why I mentioned, you know, kind of last time, the racial part, we're, in America, we're seeing a huge divide, primarily black and white, in, in terms of how we approach this. And so, you know, a black person sees something happening as it relates to policing and unarmed person being murdered. And then you say something about that in light of Genesis 126, 20, verse 27 being made in God's image. And then some evangelicals are labeling you a Marxist um, or you're called a social justice warrior. And they're not taking into account your biblical worldview, which could be biblically orthodox and sound just because it makes them uncomfortable or they have assumptions about those other views you're wrongly labeled. And so the conversation has ended before it started because you've already mischaracterized somebody based on a lot of times assumptions and limited knowledge. And so what we're seeing here in America in terms of primarily, and again, I wanna say primarily not all, uh, white evangelicals are labeling those that say, hey, we the, 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 the Lord cares about policing. You know, he cares about people being uh, treated fairly because they're made in his image. And then when that happens and we speak about police brutality, then there's an assumption that you're embracing organizations like Black Lives Matter. 
if you just say that phrase, there's an assumption that you're break, bringing in everything that that organization stands for. You're not giving nuance to say, I agree with the sentiment Black Lives Matter, but I, but I don't agree with the organization after reading their core values because some of those are antithetical, anti, antithetical to a biblical worldview. And so um, I don't really see any positives. Obviously, this is a dialogue. Um, but but typically, I don't see positives in make, bringing those in as a monolith because they each represent different things. And I think humanity is complex, so we we can't see people or these ideals as through through a monolithic lens. Fantastically put. Um, let me go to uh, Reverend Murray. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding the pitfalls and advantages of treating critical race theory, intersectionality, and social justice as a monolith? Yes, I, I, I pretty much agree with what Pastor Jerome said there. I've seen this whole grouping everything together used as a stick to beat people over the head, basically. Uh, you say one thing in one certain direction, and then this entire field, which gets neatly crystallized down, which I'm not sure how people are able to do that, because I'm not able to do that, and I know lots of really people smarter than me who are not able to do that. It gets crystallized down to one little thing called cultural Marxism, and it gets attributed to you. And, and all the baggage that comes along um, with that. And so I, I think that's incredibly unhelpful. I think that's a, a power play in and of itself and a, a, um, a form of, we, we talk a lot about cancel culture. It's a, it's a form of cancel culture uh, that exists in evangelical circles um, and very unhelpful because it doesn't, it doesn't actually help us as evangelicals do what we are known for doing, which is get back to the Bible and actually evaluate all the different nuances of this on the basis of the text and say, well, what does the text say about this subject and that subject? And um, so I, I, I find it very unhelpful from that point of view. Um, at the same time, the, the one slight caution I would add in is that I do see forms of kind of a, a popular critical race theory appearing now and again in certain rhetoric um, outside of the evangelical world. Uh, and so while, 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 while an opponent might come to me and say, um, you're, you're a critical race theorist because you speak about justice. Uh, you preach a sermon about justice on Sunday and say, you must be a cultural Marxist and, 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 and all that. And I would want to say, no, but hang on, there's, there's a whole lot going on. And I want to want to sit down and explain everything. Um, they'll be able to point me to... Um, some places in the popular culture where people have lumped all these things together and have used it to dismiss whole groups of people. And so I often find myself in a difficult position there because you've got to, you've, it takes so much time and energy and effort to be able to sit down and, and, and explain why, why it's unhelpful to, to, to pull everything together. Um, but then every now and again, you get an example in the popular media of someone who does do that. And so your, your, your critics can then straight away point to that and go, well, look, see, see, there, there's an example of it. There, there's an example of a person who thinks that every single white person on the planet is guilty just by the fact that they are white kind of thing. <laughs> Have this inherent like imputed guilt in the same way we think about Adam and, and imputed guilt. And, and, and I want to try and dial that back and explain, okay, I know that one individual probably believes that, but that's not what most people in the field believe or, or, or think. Um, and, and so I find that space really difficult to navigate between this kind of popular level cri critical race theory that exists and, and the, the broader academic field and, and the nuanced discussion. Fantastically put. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I see a hand. Uh, I'm going to uh, acknowledge that hand in a moment. Um, before I do, I just want to say there is a, a theme of nuance and a theme of um, of understanding nuance that is coming through, rather, and uh, we'll come back to that. Over to you, uh, Dr. Edwards. Uh, thank you, and I, I certainly don't want to slow us down in any way, but I think while I don't think we should treat anything as, as a monolith, <laughs> but that's just, I, I would think that about almost every discipline, but I would say the reality is none of us carry one single identity. So that's why these things keep keep happening because I mean there's no women on the panel right now, right? So so it's so I don't want to speak for women, but that's actually one of the issues, right? Is that if if there were a woman of color uh, uh, in another country, all those identities are wrapped in, and so so it's hard to to say that they're not somehow connected. Although again, not monolithic, but they but there's a way of saying or recognizing, and there's nuance again 
that we carry multiple identities at any one place, my faith, my maleness, my uh, race, my ethnicity, my nationality. So all of those get touched on in some way or another. So I just want to say that uh, while they you know, while they don't get lumped together, they do overlap. If, if we drew our Venn diagrams, they would connect in some way. Brilliantly put. And I think this touches on the theme of complexity that Pastor Jerome Gay mentioned earlier on, that human beings are complex. And so to try and have this monolithic approach would actually lend us in a very difficult uh, space. There's a lot to mine here, and I think this question warrants more time, but we will leave it here for now and maybe hear from our audience if they have any questions uh, in this direction. We'll move on to the next question, which is, um, excuse me, the number is off there. So, to what extent is critical race theory compatible with Christian theology and a Christian worldview? To what extent is Christ critical race theory compatible with Christian theology and a Christian worldview? I will start with Pastor Onimakate and then move on to Pastor Venon Light on this one. And then I'll leave out some time for others if they want to add a few thoughts. Sure, um, and, and that's a great question. Um, and a question that I think many of us in, in the church space or as church leaders um, are finding ourselves having to answer. And I, and I think, you know, where we started, where we talk about critical race theory or just critical theory as a, a way of analyzing or critiquing, uh, and this can be both in the negative and the positive, uh, the way that we live, uh, critiquing or analyzing society and seeking to bring about change. Um, and so what, what it does is it, it almost causes us or forces us, depending on what the issue is, to engage a real problem. Um, and it's something I think we sometimes as the church tend to stay away from. Um, these theories uh, are causing us to, okay, hey, we have to face these problems. And so it causes us to engage a real problem. Um, but, and maybe this might go a little bit to the question before, but I'll, I'll drag it in here to, to connect it, is it always leaves us kind of with an insufficient solution. And I think that's why people tend to bring all those together, because, you know, if you bring only critical race theory, if you bring only intersectionality or social justice, um, you realize very quickly that it's, man, uh, whatever I get may be helpful, but it's an insufficient solution. And so we cluster them together, again, trying to find the solution. And even then, uh, it's, it's insufficient. Um, but where it's compatible with, with Christian theology and a Christian worldview um, is that it we as Christians are called uh, to justice and mercy. Uh, we're called to, to seek justice and mercy um, for those who, who have been oppressed. And so that's one of kind of the, the factors of critical race is it has a oppressed and uh, an oppressor. Um, it, it also looks at a system, like how, how did we get here or what are the perpetuating systems that keep us here? Um, and then it longs for liberation. Um, it wants to upset power or privilege. Um, and so when I put on my, my Christian lens um, or my Christian worldview, um, we see in, in various parts of scripture where, as the church, we're called to do that. We're called to look into society and say, where, where, where do we see the oppressed? Where do we see injustice? And what does the gospel compel us to do? Um, so there's that, let's analyze what's going on. Uh, if I take us to, um, I believe it's Acts, uh, Acts 6, uh, where... Uh, we see the Hellenistic um, widows, they're not getting, you know, what, what, they, what they're looking for. And, and so again, it's like, okay, wait, how, how do we remedy this? Let's analyze what's the problem, but how do we remedy this situation? Because we, we want to see a society in a sense uh, that, that cares for one another, loves one another, uh, that there is justice that permeates in that society. Uh, but how we get the, the, the vehicle or the power that's a whole nother conversation. I think we will get to that. Um, so, so that's. I'd start by saying that is that the similarities there or the compatibility there is is the is the analyzing, is the critiquing, um, and maybe going through those various things of okay, trying to understand the problem. What what are the issues at play? Fantastically put. Uh, over to you, uh, Reverend Light. Um, I think that perhaps one of the more limited aspects of critical race theory is that you know it divides the world into the um, the oppressor race and the oppressed race and uh, though that is important to take note of and i think the previous uh, panelists 
dealt with that aspect. But I think um, the danger is of dividing, you know, the human race into <clears throat> oppressors and oppressed. It, 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 it misses that within those different groups, the, the two so-called main groups, you've got various um, sinful aspects which perhaps are not picked up as they should be uh, in, in critical race theory. So that would be a, a shortcoming, um, an incompatibility with Christian theology. Christian theology and Christian worldview basically deals with, with us all in sort of, in, if you like, in one category, in, in, in one group. And so um, race, uh, critical race theory sometimes blurs the reality of a wide range of other sins that both those groups, the oppressed and the oppressors, would need to be faced with if uh, Christian theology and a Christian worldview is brought fully to bear upon the situation. That's the clip, Prince. Um, very good comments from both Pastor Mokatle and uh, Reverend Light. Uh, he shed some light for us there. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, um, any other thoughts or comments that um, our panelists may want to add to uh, this question? Uh, I see Pastor Jerome Gay's mic is unmuted, so I'll yield the mic to you. Over to you. Yeah, I, I would just say I think the biggest aspect of incompatibility of it with the Christian worldview is it makes a feature of your identity the foundation of your identity. And so my blackness is a feature of who I am, um, but my identity is in Christ. And so when you actually look at both of those, it you are identified by what group you fall into, which would oppose scripture um, in, in, in terms of identity. Now, in terms of seeking to understand these things, I think it's it's definitely making an attempt. And I think, you know, Christians, you know, we are called to, you know, Micah, Micah 6, 8, you know, do justice. So we're called to do justice. We're called to care for the poor. Uh, Jesus talks about neglecting the weightier matters of the law, justice being one of them, Matthew 23, 23. So, you know, to One's point, yeah, we, we should pursue these things. Pastor One's point, we should pursue these things. But where it falls short is, again, the, the foundation of identity. And so that that's where I would that was I would say that's a big incompatibility because that's not the foundation uh, for, for a Christian theist. That's not the foundation of identity. Fantastically put. Uh, and I hear echoes of Paul um, with the in Christ uh, language uh, that unifies Jew, Gentile, barbarian and so forth. Uh, and I also hear the call of uh, Paul uh, to identify uh, with those who are at the very bottom rank. So in a way, we are seeing a tension appearing uh, in, in this discussion in the sense that critical race theory does not give us the answers uh, to the questions that we are all grappling with at fundamental level. Basically, who are we and what went wrong? The fundamental questions of existence that Christian theology addresses on a very deep level. So I will explore these further as we continue with the discussion, but thank you uh, for uh, opening that up for us. The next question we have uh, before our uh, before we pause for a speed round is what should we affirm, debunk, and be wary of concerning critical race theory? So I'll hand this one over to uh, Dr. Edwards and uh, uh, Reverend Murray. Over to you. Okay, you can can you hear me? Okay. Yes, you're coming through okay. loudly. Yeah, I was having a little difficulty early. I could hear everyone, but could not see for a moment. Um. I appreciate all of that. I I I, I may have some uh, 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 nuances myself in terms of these uh, topics related to identity and where the Apostle Paul lined up. But I think my my biggest issue is that um, is that as evangelicals or as Christian believers, sometimes we are skeptical just by nature of anything that emerges from thinkers that are not Christian. I don't I don't think we need to have that kind of fear. I think we can we can, as I think it was a Brother Murray was saying earlier, we can sort of 
pass any idea through our our biblical lens and see what holds up you know so i think we can discern issues related to power to privilege uh, uh issues i mean it, at the very beginning of this bat you said um that you would, we would not tolerate xenophobia, misogyny, and comments like that because we acknowledge that some people can harm other people uh, uh, by language, by by uh, by exercising a certain kind of uh, privilege, if you will, and power. So I think that we can affirm that kind of analysis. I think what we just we're just trying to be careful that we don't get to a place where we think uh, worldly ideas trump biblical ideas. And so I think that that's what. I'm hearing from my brothers on the panel, and I would I would agree with that. So I think we can affirm the power issues that highlight something, and I think we have to be wary of of thinking that everything has maybe a political solution because I think in America that's what some people are afraid of that it's about politics rather than um, than biblical uh, truth. Fantastic input. Um, uh, any uh, over to you, uh, Reverend Murray. I think you're muted. Sorry, if you may just rewind about five seconds and then begin again. How is that? No. Is that good? There we go. I I find on the whole that I've been helped a lot by critical theories in general. Uh, and that's partly because I have grown up immersed in individualist thinking in kind of rigid meritocracy in, in the world. As a white person growing up in post-apartheid South Africa, we had to employ all those things to legitimize our place in the society. Why are we all wealthy and all the black folk in our country are generally in impoverished areas and that? You had to you had to create all sorts of things in your head to explain that. And so you had to have this rigid meritocracy, this rigid, rugged individualism that white people are like they are because they did the right things and black people are like they are because they did the wrong things. Um, and and so growing up with that background, having a theory that comes along and just critiques all of that and looks at the power dynamics and the history and has been in many ways massively liberating for me. And it's helped me go back to the Bible and seeing, for example, the depth of sin, how pervasive sin is and how much more work I need to do in, in ex expositing the scriptures and the gospel and applying it to people to be able to and do so. So I, in many ways, I'm, I'm very grateful to secular theories like this that, that help me to do that. They, they help me to ask questions. I'm still trying to get my answers from the Bible. I don't get my answers from, from the theory in and of itself, but, but they're helping me ask important questions that I wouldn't have asked otherwise had I not encountered the theories. And so I, I find that beneficial. I think in terms of being wary is is some forms of hard critical race theory that want to essentialize people in terms of their identities and i think everyone's kind of spoken about that already i think those are incredibly dangerous um because they undermine our identity in christ they undermine they undermine unity they undermine um all, the, all those sorts of things um but i'm not i, I don't have a fear a massive fear around critical race theory like i find a lot of people in certain evangelical circles have i i i, I I want to engage with it. I want to understand. I want to learn. I want to take what I can use, and then I want to discard what is not helpful to me. Um, that, that's how I have tried to approach it. Brilliantly put. Thank you so much for that. Um, is that the, we have room for uh, one more passing around if anyone wants to add to this question or to answer this question, and then we'll move on to our speed round. Um, I see uh, a finger has been raised, so we'll yield the mic to Reverend Light. Over to you. Thanks. <clears throat> it's just that, um, you know, if you divide society into the two groups, the oppressors and the oppressed, it, it doesn't enable one to fully appreciate, and this would be from a biblical perspective, that in both those groups, there would be um, various other sinful practices. I mean, even if you're in the so-called oppressed group, within that oppressed group, obviously it's possible for people to be oppressing others uh, within that uh, oppressed group. So um, that's my concern about critical race theory. In one sense, it's, it's helpful, as we've heard, 
uh, it is true that you do have in society um, the more dominant, not necessarily one dominant um, group, maybe many, and you might have one or many, you know, um, groups that are being subordinated um, and oppressed. But I think critical race theory lacks the, the lens to look at each of those groups fairly, um, you know, from a biblical perspective on the sinful nature. And that um, in both those groups, you've got um, people sinning, um, you know, exercising authority, excessive authority. Um, so in that sense, I would be a little bit uh, wary of critical race theory. It's not comprehensive enough. I think, I think the point is clear there that um, there are limitations to how one can apply uh, critical race theory, uh, and there are things to be wary of, yet there are also things to affirm uh, in that it helps us uh, consider things we may not be aware of, as was the case with Reverend Murray, who said he was aware, unaware of certain things in the South African context uh, based on the history of that uh, uh, space. Uh, folk, uh, we are now about to move to our speed around section, and the question we have prepared for you is this just to uh, blow off some steam and move away from critical race theory. What piece of music are you listening to? Uh, is it Busi uh, Mashasena or is it Kari uh, Joba? Uh, who is it that you're listening to uh, and who, why are they on repeat? So I'll start from my left to my right, uh, beginning with Dr. Dre or Dr. Dennis Edwards. No hint there. Uh, over to you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, my, my camera seems to be frozen. I can't I can't see myself, but um, I'm going to be the boring old guy. I listen to a lot of Bach. I actually like um, 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 Baroque music, so I listen to that over and over again. <laughs> and what many people don't know is that you actually are a musician, so you play a few instruments. So yeah, I play, I, play the, I play woodwinds. I play flute and stuff. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, moving on to Pastor Gay, over to you. Uh, anything that's on repeat on your speakers? Yeah, a guy named uh, Tobe, uh, Tobe Chuku Dubim Wewe. Um, uh, Tobe Nwewe here uh, in the States. He's uh, uh, Nigerian born, but he's a, he's a rapper. Um, always has his wife with him in his videos. And um, he, he deals with a lot of topics. Um, so uh, I just I just like his approach. And I, I, I appreciate, you know, how uh, his creativity and how he incorporates his team. So that's one of the guys I'm listening to right now. Oh, fantastic to hear. So I'll be interested to hear what you thought of uh, Lecrae's uh, restoration album. Uh, maybe that's a conversation via email. Uh, we can pick that up later. But uh, moving on to our brother, uh, Reverend Oni Mokatle, over to you. Or Reverend Buster, it changes according to how I feel. So, Jay, I'm not going to drop a bar on you, brother. Over to you. Um, I've been recently listening to uh, the groups called The Porter's Gate. Um, they recently came out with an album called Just Justice Songs, and uh, and really really enjoyed just the the abil their ability to take uh, portions of scripture and you know turn them into a, a musical piece. Um, it's just another way of of telling telling a story. Um, and so yeah, so that just the season that we're in. Um, not just you know globally, but here in South Africa as well. Um, it resonates to to a lot of what's going on. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Stephen. Over to you. So I um, have been listening to uh, the latest Killers album, actually, uh, and the reason for that is just that it sounds a lot like their older albums, where I kind of went off them for a while because um, you know bands they start with a certain sound. And then they try to get clever and change their sound and do something else. And then the fans are like, but we like you because of the sound that you had at the beginning. Um, well, I feel like the killers in this last album have gone back to their original kind of grinding indie rock, which is what I like. So I've been listening to them a lot lately. So one may say they killed it. Mm. Uh, so moving on to uh, uh, Reverend Light, uh, what is enlightening your musical palette at the moment? Over to you. I must say that uh, I, I listen quite widely, but uh, what I enjoy is tuning in uh, through my hearing aids, um, giving me 
all the sounds, all the instruments, classical music uh, from uh, the, the UK. So um, I've been amazed at if you choose the right classical uh, pieces, it can be very exhilarating, stirring, uh, amazing. I sometimes find myself thinking, you know, what does it take to produce a, um, um, a, you know, a 20 minute or so uh, a classical piece with all the various instruments and what goes into a modern pop song? Um, anyway, it's, it's classical music. Much of it I, I've been enjoying, and some of it gets repeated, but I can't remember all the names, but certainly some of the great um, classical um, um, you know, writers of music and, and so forth, that's been my sort of bread and butter on the music side. Fantastic, thank you. And if you're interested, well, I'm listening to Muse at the moment, so uh, I'm trying to get into their sound, which is uh, quite rich. Uh, to play one of your pieces but it's a, it's a bit difficult but we'll get to that later so uh we now that we have uh, sped through that round uh we're going to open up to our audience uh, so we have a few questions that have been posted in the chat box uh, and i'm going to rattle through a few of them as we build up to 10 o'clock uh, 